What's up? Hello, everybody. My name is Sandy Jones. I, I work here at Google, so welcome, everybody, to uh, Google New York. It's quite a sprawling campus, so uh, we try to have a different space this time to get you a different perspective. Uh, if you go to each different building, it's a little, a little unique, and it is part of our collaboration strategy, actually. So uh, if you'll notice, uh, you may actually not see a lot of it from here, but as you go down the hallways, there's little booths that you can grab. Two-person phone booths has become our predominant video conferencing. There's places to grab a nap. There's small places for people to meet. The food areas uh, across the hallway are designed for people to collaborate and stay in the building so we get more productivity out of you. But uh, the whole space is actually designed to kind of instill the same collaboration principles you probably experienced at university. Uh, so we try to kind of create a campus feel. Um, today I'm going to use uh, a little bit of Google technology to present to you so uh, I can actually do this off my phone. Um, we try to create, that, as we mentioned, the frictionless idea that you know, if I forget my laptop at work, I can grab one and, and work right from there. I can do everything from my phone that I do from that laptop, or we have in-room solutions so that if I don't have anything at all, I can still join a meeting and that sort of thing. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about how to reimagine your business in the cloud, because that is really what Google's all about. Uh, I think we, we started before uh, Mark Benioff, or I guess it was uh, Larry or Oracle, termed the word cloud. Uh, back in that day, which is called the internet. Uh, so I, I always kind of jokingly say Google's main philosophy is actually just more internet. More internet means more search, hence we do self-driving cars, we do tools that use uh, the internet, but really it's about adopting the cloud and getting the benefits of that technology. Um, let's talk a little bit about the business world though, and this was kind of brought up, uh, some of the, the changes in the business world. You know, and These are the macro changes that are impacting the way people work today, right? Um, Changing markets, the S&P 500 is going to turn over uh, in the next 10 years. It'll be at least 50 percent different. We've already seen a lot of churn. Uh, Ian mentioned us appearing in that it is one of those examples of the ever-changing S&P 500. Uh, the amount of connected things. I, I like to say we live in a, a data economy now, and so all these what is it, 20 billion connected things feeding data in. How do you use that data? How do you action on it? That's become a big change in the marketplace, and then well as well changing customer needs. And that's really kind of two customers, actually. There's your actual customers you sell to, but also your internal customers and their changing needs uh, in the marketplace as well. That's largely being driven by consumer technology. So Google's a big player in, in that space as well. And you know, as we've seen that change, that's driven expectations inside of businesses to adopt a similar technology stack. And, and that's tremendously challenging. To change the consumer technology space, you just put an application out there and people either use it or you don't, you're successful or not. In the enterprise space, you have to factor in so many other pieces, uh, compliance, how that business works, who that business works with, and, and all sort of other things. Uh, so that's kind of the macro changes. Um, there's also kind of the, the, the micro changes. Um, just, no, I guess that's it. The, the micro changes on sort of your status quo, right? That's inside of your business. And you know, you've got people working from home now, you've got people multitasking. I'm a terrible multitasker. I think it's a Google thing. You know, I me in a meeting without my phone and my laptop means I can do one third of the work that at least in my head anyway. Uh, but but that's absolutely become a way that we work these days, right? Is multitasking. Uh, communication is critical. I, I think that's something that, that Google kind of embraced a, a long time ago is this idea that collaboration needs to be pervasive around everything you do in your business. Communication needs to be a part of everything. Uh, in a traditional kind of workforce, you would sit down and work on your own and then pass that off to somebody else. We, we definitely don't believe that that's the way the way things can work. So, um, you know, legacy tools tend to not have that same frictionless feel or that same collaborative feel, uh, and it disengages the employees, and we just end up doing a lot of repetition or work for no reason that dies on the vine somewhere. So, I want to talk about a couple predominant philosophies that we've kind of adopted here at Google. I think they're common in the marketplace as well. And one of them is this idea of pure cloud. We'll talk a little bit about cloud solutions. We kind of believe in a purity of cloud. It's still going to be hardware. It's still a key part of it. But the solution itself must be purely driven off the cloud. There's sort of four key reasons I like to bring up. One is the simplicity. That's that consumer world coming into the tools. A cloud application can just run off a web browser or an app that I download as easy as I download Angry Birds for my two-year-old daughter. Uh, security is another key piece of cloud solutions. Basically, the cloud provider is responsible for that security. So it's either fantastic or maybe not. That depends on the cloud provider. But at least it's not your 
cross to bear. You're not responsible for that security. You can leverage the skills of that cloud provider. So the, sort of the main cloud providers out there, they're investing a ton of money in that security and to end encryption, ensuring that your data is handled properly and all the rest, and there's no breaches, so that you don't have to do that. Uh, the second is speed, and that's the speed your organization works at. Nothing's locked in a data silo, nothing's on somebody's computer, it's in the cloud and available to be shared very quickly. I mentioned that, that data economy thing, right? We're, we're at this evolution in technology where we can do things we kind of didn't think we'd be able to do, take massive amounts of data and crunch them down and understand what one individual would like to buy at that moment. It's a kind of an example of, of what Google can do with data. The question is how do you action on that? How do you take that from a data scientist and pivot over to a marketing person or a salesperson so they can use that data? And that's that speed I'm talking about that comes from pure cloud. I don't need to aggregate a file out, hand that off to a, somebody through a file share or something like that. I just share them in and, and they take the ball and go from there. Uh, or you know, I give them a, a subset of that data set that I've crunched using some big query or big data technology and I just give them what they need to action and move forward. And the last is innovation, the speed. It's kind of a speed one again, but I wanted to have a fourth point. Uh, but the, the speed of innovation, right? The, there's no versions. I don't, when I go to Facebook, I don't go onto Facebook 2.0 or Facebook 3.0, right? It's just Facebook, and it should always be the latest version. That's speed of innovation, right? When they do a patch or an update, I just get that and I start working with that. And that's not just a sort of a factor of technology, it's also a spirit of technology. You need to adopt this spirit of constant updates, constant innovation uh, inside of your organizations to adopt these technologies. That's sort of the, the challenging part I think we, we sort of see at Google is we want to get away from you know, legacy versions. We need to convince the working world that this is the way they need to work. Constant change needs to be the new way they work. And I think everybody believes that's right. It's just whether everybody can shift to that constant changing environment, that speed of innovation that's coming at them. Um, now, obviously, this means that things need to kind of change from, from traditional working. I, I think there's, like I said, there's a bunch of macro forces and micro forces in your company. Your, um, you know, millennials are becoming the predominant sort of uh, generation in the workforce. I think it's at 50% now uh, in the workforce is millennials. So, you know, that's brought its own change. That's something that's always happening throughout history. One generation comes along and supersedes the next. We also have this convergence, though, of technology and, and moving to the cloud and starting to do big data things. And then the other, all the other sort of macro forces that I mentioned. So it, it drives a need for a change, right? We need to adopt new tools. Legacy tools aren't kind of keeping up. And what we found is that to just make that change doesn't work. There's a critical piece, and it's from the middle of that slide there, that you need to focus on in order to make a change in your tool set and the way you do business. And that's a cultural change. You need to make a cultural shift, or you at least need to consider the cultural impact that that tool's having. Right? It's an impact on how you work together, how we engage, that collaboration piece. It's an impact on the speed in which we make decisions. It's an impact on um, you know, how we measure things in order to choose a direction. That's kind of that big data feeding into small data and how you adopt that from a cultural perspective or how you become a, a data-driven decision-making organization. And then how do we create, how do we add value to the company? How do we create content or uh, you know, marketing programs or whatever it, it is? All of that is underpinned by a cultural transition you can call it change management, but there's an element of cultural change management that needs to be considered, that's often overlooked, that's typically the reason for failure of, of a transformation project, let's call it. And this is not from me or Google, this is from Gartner. So they did a, a really good study on how not focusing on culture or focusing on culture can win or lose a transformation, like swapping out an entire productivity suite changing somebody's mail server, that's the Google side of things, or you know, moving things from an on-premise into a cloud. These are big cultural transitions for companies. If you don't address that, you're kind of doomed to failure. And I kind of uh, love this one. It kind of shows the, the evolution of that and how culture maps on. This is kind of from a non-collaboration, sort of linear company to a truly full, fully collaborative uh, organization. And there's these kind of four stages where you, you know, you, your first stage is you like that your mail is in the cloud. I can go on any browser and I can get to my mail. The second is as an individual, I'm empowered now and I can start to do things, access things, and work in ways that maybe elevates me and my, my role and gives me a little bit more power. And then the third is now I'm teaming. Now I have teams of people that I work with and I leverage and the work I need to do has gotten smaller and better because it's now focused on what I do best instead of me doing all the pieces or you know, things breaking down in the handoffs. 
And then finally, four states, we have that enterprise-wide change. And then through that, there's this kind of cultural transformation that has to happen. Because if you have a culture that discourages collaboration, you're never going to get to the end without you know, convincing people they need to work together. right? Convincing people they need to turn on the camera when they're in a video conference. Right? The whole point of video conferencing is to look at somebody's face and get the, the um, body language added on to the language. And, and yet, we still struggle with that. That was actually you know, probably the biggest thing I noticed in coming to Google. I came from a digital native company, Salesforce, to Google. Uh, at Salesforce, it was common, and I'm sure you guys know this terrible pain, to find the video conference units pulled apart by some executive that was afraid of Big Brother watching him from San Francisco. I lived in Toronto at the time. Uh, I came to Google, and now it's just everything works. I touch a button, there's always a face on a screen. Somebody mentioned uh, when there's four people in a meeting, at least one's remote. I'd say at Google, it's almost like when there's two people and meeting ones remote, and they're like on the floor below you. Um, but like, <laughs> we, we just sort of said, we've so adopted this video good culture, and it happens day one, right? That cultural change is day one, you don't keep your camera off. And we've recently gone through kind of a hiring blitz, we've had a lot of new people, so there's a lot of uh, icons or, uh, you know, their, what is it, their like profile pic shows up instead because they have their camera off. And so I'm seeing it, you know, I've seen this weird step back that we've taken as we've added more people in, and they'll, they're new, so in a few weeks they'll be fully on the screen. And some of them get it quicker than others, but it's this cultural transformation that happens when you join here at Google. And this uh, this is really, no matter what cloud tool I put up, Google's numbers, some, uh, you know, that's the ones I have access to, but this is true no matter what activity suite you move to the cloud. There's really only two of us, so I think you know where I'm getting at. But people enjoy work more. People become more innovative, and they have a significant impact on their work. Rarely do you see even these numbers, and they're not ridiculously crazy, but 41% of people thinking that a cloud tool has a significant impact on their work is pretty impressive when you think of that impacting every single employee in the company. That's, that's pretty dramatic, let alone enjoying work. I, I, I think I'm getting that uh, transformation, but it's been, been a while. Um, so just talking a little bit about, about the way we see the, the tool sets, uh, and, and Ann mentioned that we are deaf, just a full disclosure, we're at one of those proprietary platforms that you mentioned. You know, we, we're trying to do all the pieces you need around collaboration because we believe they, they work well together, and I'll talk a bit about that. But we see kind of three big chunks, communicate, collaborate, and control. Uh, so communications includes traditional email and things like that, but it's also video, chat, and all the other pieces. And those pieces are collapsing in on each other and becoming actually just one way of communicating, but different mechanisms I use to communicate. So my chat room should be the same as my video conference room if I so choose. I can just click a button. Kind of thing. Uh, collaboration is more the content creation tools and how I share that. Like I said, that's how you disseminate the content uh, through your organization and how you break down data silos, but also how you kill versions. Versions, I think, are one of the uh, biggest time sucks in an organization is creating versions of, of documents and handing them around. Collaboration can help attack that. And then finally, of course, you need a way to control that. Uh, you need a way to meet compliance regulations. You need a way to turn on and off users and basically let the admins do what they need to do. Uh, so let's talk how that all translates into kind of reimagining your business. It's going to speed up things. It's going to make things smarter and make people work together. Uh, and so making it fast means you work together in real time. Again, that's a cloud element, right? Without cloud, you can't work together in real time. And so, you know, what we believe is when you're working on, say, a slide deck, I'm working on this presentation, when I want to bring in a sales engineer or my boss, I don't need to package it up and send it to them, pass them the conch, so to, so to speak. I can just hop in there, get their feedback. They can work on the same slide as me as we work. It also means, down at the bottom point, we can work in parallel. So they can go to a different slide, and we can work in parallel but separate. And those both need to be frictionless that I move from working together to working apart and never do I have to reconsolidate things back together, remove that friction from getting everything done. Things got to happen on the go. So I actually edited this slide deck on the subway, which blew my mind uh, that I could actually even manage that. A packed uh, uh, A train into work today. I'm able to bring up my document, edit it, expand in, present it. All that needs to happen on mobile, right? Mobile is already predominant enough that you need to be able to do all your work on mobile, in, in my opinion. And if you talk about that, if you look back at that millennial movement, uh, most of my nephews, like the next generation of our family, they would 
close a laptop and not even deal with it. They want to do everything on the phone. And they're tremendously better at it than I am. Like my typing on a phone is still hunt and peck. They just don't even look. They can, the ones that do have conversations with real people can like converse and text at the same time as me. So <laughs> enabling them to be good at their jobs is what mobile can do, let alone you know, salespeople, there's probably a ton in this room when you're on the road, you need your mobile device to work. Some people like to video conference from their, their dashboard. It's a little scary for me when it falls off the dashboard and I think their car rolled over. But it's hands-free, they're able to do that just as well as if they're in a meeting room. So um, incredibly valuable tool and I think, you know, I, I kind of believe that we're just getting to the generation where mobile tools are on the same plane as your laptop or, or desktop tools kit. All of that adds up to kind of these efficiencies. And again, I only use data that, that we've kind of gathered from our, our own research, but that real-time collaboration, being able to go on the, uh, the move, I don't know if I'm gonna say fewer meetings, but definitely more efficient meetings. I think we have more meetings because we have this technology that I can meet with anybody. It's like our chats go to you there, and then ours is Hangouts, so H-O question mark and then we're in a video conference. That's kind of become our mechanism, so I guess I feel like I have a lot more meetings because of that, but anyway, uh, they're very productive. Um, productivity gains, 22 million. Hours saved by employees per year, five million. Um, and that's, a, that's kind of a, a, a sample data set that goes behind this of a typical large enterprise organization um, that we base these numbers on. Making it smart is sort of the next piece, and the first one's probably obvious from a, a Google person, finding stuff, right? Um, so we've got this collaborative world where everybody shares everything, they locate their documents all in the same cloud space. How do I find it? How do I use that? You know, when I started this presentation, I didn't start from Tabla Rasa and put all my notes in. This is not my work, by the way. A lot of this is stuff I stole and then worked on and changed and, and added my work to it, but I didn't start from nothing. I did a search, brought up the right file, started working on that. Um, AI helps me with that, so whether it be AI that looks at the data I'm working on and makes suggestions, or just says, hey, your formatting is crappy, let's just fix this up for you. Click of a button, let the AI do sort of the simple things. Uh, and then finally, present using AI to prevent threats. So on the kind of collaboration communication side, email and that sort of thing, leveraging AI so that you're not having to, to do that manual labor of, of keeping threats uh, at bay. That's one way we definitely leverage AI today is you know, traversing log files, spotting threats, uh, you know, our Chronicle product is kind of designed at finding attack vectors through AI before you do that. That's pervasive out in any kind of email solution. So are you saying that I have, if I have a meeting with three or four people, that you've got AI today that can find the relative content that all those people are engaged in that maybe somewhere else? Uh, I wouldn't say... Four people working on this, your correlation with data that you've shared before, you've been in this meeting before, yeah. you've been touching these documents, do you want to open it? We're making those suggestions, yeah. I, I would say that's at its infancy, it, but we're absolutely doing that. Like, hey, you work with this person on these files. Like, when I go into Drive, it's like, hey, there's some stuff you might be interested in. It might be a file that was shared with me that's been updated since I left it last. So we're definitely using AI across the product suite to provide insights into how you work better. A, a, a more, probably, example where I think we're, we're definitely knocking out of the park is when I try and schedule a meeting with somebody. And I think you made the comment of, like, it's four people, it's a video conference. Well, we think of it's two, and so we put a video conference link in. That's just one simple piece. Then we say, okay, where are these two people sitting? Okay, that one's in Seattle, that one's in New York. So I'll suggest rooms for them to meet in, in Seattle and New York, because I know where they sit. And what times are they available? Well, I have access to their calendar, I can give the available times. And, and so, you know, that's where we're kind of at today, and taking it to, in a chat, and actually this is possible, they find us a time. And it, again, the chat can look in the calendar and do all that from the chat window. And where you're going to kind of see us going is bringing all that together under one kind of way of accessing all these files and bringing some of that AI. I, I don't want to get too ahead of our announcements that at next to give a, a plug for our conference that we're holding in uh, in April. But there'll be some some really big things around bringing the tool set under one visor. Does that answer the question? Yes. And that is absolutely the spirit and goal of where Google wants your AI to be, is like making the suggestion before you spend an hour working on a new project and, and that sort of thing. Um, I'm on my phone here, so I'm doing the next slide. Um, and, and like I said, we're in a data economy, so people need information to do their jobs. Um, I think the, the data-driven decision idea is pretty ubiquitous in, in business these days. Actually executing on it is the challenging part, right? 
how do I how do I create data sets that the people that make decisions actually understand uh, is, is a big challenge. And so uh, being able to access that, being able to bring stuff that's in a cloud solution to another cloud solution and disperse it out is, is a critical factor. Um, making things together, once I've actually got that distributed, uh, you know, all your communications in one place. I'm, I'm a little, uh, this is my slight plug for some things that will start to be more uh, publicly exposed in the next few weeks. But you know, what we're seeing is people are working predominantly collaborative in slides, sheets, and docs. So 75% of the time, they're now working with someone else. And that, A, lightens the load. It also means you have a second set of eyes for errors or inappropriate things. And you, know, you just have a better overall collaboration experience. And then you know, we talked about some of the, the integrations for both interoperability uh, in terms of the between the tools, but also interoperability between different platforms. So, um, you know, Google is doing as much as we can to make Microsoft products a first class citizen in our suite. I think, I hope it'll start to happen the other way. Um, you know, as kind of mentioned, they can be a challenging partner to work with. I think it's because they haven't felt the need to, to work with and they probably have a pretty good point. Uh, but, you know, we've introduced some things like making Microsoft documents editable inside of G Suite, right? So I can pull up a Microsoft document, work on that document right from the cloud, close that document up, share my changes with somebody working at Microsoft, and they would never know that I didn't actually own any Microsoft product at all. Right? So we're trying to just make that a seamless, frictionless experience as well, doing what we can. Um, and I kind of hit on the, the real-time piece. Uh, I won't go too much into that, but that, we're very passionate about the, the real-time nature of collaboration. And that is everything from, I'll actually go back, because I will talk a little bit about it. Um, it's everything from you know, real-time meetings. Obviously, I need to be able to jump in a meeting at the drop of a hat these days. Like the way I make a phone call yesterday is now the way I make a video conference call today. But also real time in terms of document sharing and collaboration as well. Um, you know, that is a, a critical factor. I, the best example I can actually think of real time is before I got to uh, Google. Uh, we had a huge conference change at, at Salesforce and the local VP needed to decide if we could make things happen. He needed to know how, how and when 150 salespeople were gonna be traveling and the cost associated with shifting like by three days or something. And I think it was like nine in the morning, he sent an email with a link to a, a Google Sheet. By 10 in the morning, everybody's information was in there. By 10.05, people were making fun of each other. By 10.10, he dropped the hammer and said, stop, write crap in the spreadsheet. And you know, by what, 11, he had everybody's information in one sheet. No poor admin person had to go and consolidate everything together. It was all there. He could just sum the bottom row and see this is this is what it's going to cost us, right? So that is that for me that was kind of uh, weirdly it was a catalyst I guess to me coming here. But that showed me the power of real time in terms of making a decision. It was a very <coughs> encapsulated example. Um, you know, there's obviously the the security side. Somebody mentioned that. I actually think that's probably where most conversations start uh, when we we're talking about changing your collaboration tool. Is have you evaluate our security and understand that because those questions will be the biggest questions and the biggest roadblocks if you don't actually get the right answers and the right information on that. Uh, and so, you know, we want to make sure that you feel comfortable with our, our tool. I think any cloud provider should be putting security and trust at the forefront of their their discussions with their, their customers. That was, again, just to uh, give a prop to Salesforce, that was something I definitely learned there, that, that idea of, of you're the custodian of their content. So you need to have your security buttoned up and your security posture understandable to them so that they can feel comfortable, uh, that they can control everything and aren't being exposed to unnecessary risks. Um, and then the unfortunate side of that is when that doesn't happen, I think everybody's aware of the amount of breaches that we've seen lately and they seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, this is where you can face a huge drop in ROI. Uh, I think I got it here. Um, so. Now, this is the impact of reducing your security risks and, and 5.2 million. I think that's actually conservative because it can destroy your whole business depending on what business you're in. Uh, but you know, ensuring that the cloud company is taking security seriously, but also um, recognizing that only a cloud company can take security seriously enough. Only a cloud company can put the resources in to secure your technology. And when it's in the cloud, you don't have to worry about if that person's laptop goes missing. That was a, a, a breach, one of the, the first breaches I remember discussing around Chromebooks versus traditional was somebody, some 
uh, consultant leaving a laptop. I wish I could remember the company, but left a laptop. They had huge data sets on that laptop. Somebody gets that, and now that's out into the uh, dark web and being sold. So, you know, just moving things to the cloud gives you that opportunity to free up your security uh, from worrying about do we patch our servers and we take care of everything on our side to our cloud provider has this. And so, you know, we're, we're just sort of, uh, when it, that was my point about the desktop applications. I, I won't uh, get into that, you know, the attacks tend to come from shadow IT that's going on on laptops. Um, a little bit more about the, the breach stuff, so I think I've beaten that one to death. Um, so just a, a, an overview of some of the benefits we see from the business value side of cloud, uh, increased revenue, saving worker days, re significant risk in, risk in uh, breach threats, and then reduction in tech support. And that's one I think that goes overlooked a lot in terms of both general productivity collaboration that I'm talking about, but specifically also in the AV world. Um, cloud tools reduce that significantly. And, and I, I forget again who made the comment of, a lot of times those end up being, hey, I tried to dial into this from my home where I have a great package for downloading Netflix, but a terrible package for uploading uh, content, and now I'm having a crappy meeting experience. So there needs to be tools to, to help you with those, but, but generally we see a huge drop in the amount of tech support because now I don't have to worry about which operating system they're running, which version they've installed, have they installed something else, did they open a macro that had malware and now that's the problem with everything. You know, I, I strip all that away and now I'm just living in, in a cloud space where I have a lot less attack vectors to work at, worry about. And then sort of just a, a economic impact overall. And, and really the point of this is just to talk about moving from um, uh, to a, to a, from a CapEx to an OpEx form of, of expenditure, right? This gives a lot of flexibility to accounting departments. There's a few things in between there. You know, I can uh, reduce platforms. I can do things like bring MDM. This is sort of that proprietary platform versus best of breed. I can start to centralize some of my costs, but I can also move from a capital expenditure to an operating expenditure and understand, you know, get a little flexibility in terms of how I account for these initiatives, especially in a time when I'm trying to transform my business, I'm facing external factors. If, you know, if I'm a retailer, I have to be uh, building out things just to sell more against Amazon. I don't want to be worrying about building out my infrastructure for collaboration and that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, that kind of summarizes what I want to talk about. And the, and the key points uh, I just want to kind of reiterate. One, one of our firm beliefs is pure cloud because of the simplicity, the security, and the speed. We also recognize that this is a cultural change, and um, I, I think you know, some people, times people think we're trying to get people to work like, like Google. I think what we're trying to get people to do is work like digital natives, trying to get people to embrace the internet, embrace the cloud, because it frees you of all these other pieces that you need to worry about and maintain and allows you to focus on your, your business. But to get there, you need to make this cultural transformation. You need to think differently about how you work. It's an opportunity to do that, but it's also a challenge that you need to get buy-in from the whole organization. So for you guys out there taking organizations on this journey, it means you need to get the highest level of the organization saying, this is how we need to do our business going forward from a strategic standpoint, or we're gonna get eaten up by some startup that's in a garage right now. Right? And, and without that kind of messaging, that top-down messaging, that cultural shift, you don't make decisions faster. You, know, you don't create content quicker and better. You know, you don't take advantage of any of the benefits of these cloud collaboration solutions. You just move from one tool to another and keep doing the same things the way you did before. So with that, I did want to leave some time for Q&A as well and, and sort of answer anything around Google, uh, including the, the comments from earlier if you want to talk specifically about uh, our meeting room solutions or Jamboards. I'm, I'm well versed on that as well, so I'll open up the floor to everyone else. So do you see adoption as a long-term strategy for this? I mean, because you know, for folks who have been in Microsoft productivity suite for very long. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, Tom Snow, Investor Trust. Um, do you guys see this as a, a long-term strategy? Because there's so much. Uh, what's the word? <laughs> there's so much momentum and so much uh, learning curve involved. 
Yeah, yeah. As, as the younger folk come up, they're not, you know, <laughs> harnessed with that as much. Yeah, absolutely. So there was definitely a long-term play. Whoops, killed my wire there. Definitely a long-term play. If you look at our penetration in the EDU space, you could see that's our long-term play. Uh, I think Oracle did it back in the, the late 90s, and so every internet application was built on Oracle. I was one of those people that came out of, out of college, and I knew how to use Oracle because they'd given it free to, to the university. And so there's a, that EDU strategy, definitely, and that's a long play. I think we're also, you know, we're, we're for companies that are looking to make a change, right? The, the, I brought the macro uh, sort of piece because you've seen how disruptions happen in, in weird industries you never would have thought, right? Like taxis. Who thought Uber was going to come along and just completely change that and then start delivering food on top of it? I did not see that coming. Um, delivering Christmas trees and puppies at one point. But um, that disruption happens when you don't make that change, when you stick with the status quo. So, I, you know, I think our feeling is everybody feels this pressure from you know, macro forces and the micro forces. I put the millennials in kind of the internal force that's changing as your workforce is changing. You need to bring the tools that they, they're used to. Uh, my first job out of college, like real first short-term job was at a, a bank in Canada. They put me in front of a green screen computer and I couldn't get out of there fast enough, right? Like, this is not where I'm gonna learn you know, like new technology. Um, and so, you know, you don't want to be doing that. You don't want to be sitting them with tools that frustrate them and make them feel like they're in their parents' job. Uh, so, definitely there's long play, but there's also a more present play, I think, of companies that are feeling the pressure of needing to transform the way they do business. Uh, a good case study uh, we had was Whirlpool. You know, they were feeling pressure of organizations, generally Asian-based organizations, that were able to iterate quicker on product development, and they felt that product collaboration was the problem and the cure. So you know, they weren't collaborating enough and they needed to do that, uh, up with that. And so they came over to Google because it would reduce the cycles they would have in a product launch. And so I, I, I don't want to say we're just relying on the long term because that's absolutely not it. We're relying on organizations that are looking to move into a digital age even if they're not inherently a digital company like Whirlpool, like Colgate. Yeah, it goes back to your culture slide. Right. If you can get the top up to say, hey, this is who we are, this is how we're going to be, you know, how it works. Maybe, you know, that's that's cool if you've yeah. got that kind of uh, <laughs> force coming down. A hundred percent. If it's not happening at the top, it's probably not going to happen. And that's that's what we. I think like a, a true dramatic cultural shift in your business takes it takes a, definitely a change management. And it, it does take a little bit of pain for some people. For some other people, it's going to be like this is a huge relief. We finally got things that that I can work collaboratively with in real time with people. Um, other people are going to be like, well, I'm. I'm a little scared of that, right? I, I, I'm from the stranger danger generation, you know, I don't like to post things on social media still, but I'm not the norm. Most people want to share and collaborate, and I love the collaboration side. I still leverage the hell out of that and work on a daily basis, but, um, you know, it takes a cultural change. Yeah, to your point about meeting with video and collaborating, I typically do that with someone this far away from me. And, yeah. And it's just easier to both work on a document when you're not over someone's shoulder. Yeah, absolutely. Well, like, hey, let's just get into not a Google video thing, but a video thing. On they all do the same end yeah, result of connecting things. people and, and making you collaborate in a, an entirely different way. Um, you know, how it ties into the rest of your products is sort of up to you on a business decision, but uh, yeah, absolutely. How fast does that change? Can it happen overnight, literally? Uh, how fast does what change? Like a company moving from Microsoft to uh, Suite. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, there's different strategies for how you approach it. and. And I mean, I just want to be clear. I, I sort of see you got to move to pure cloud. And there's ways to do that with both of our products, just to be clear. Um, but I think in our case, being pure cloud, it offers an opportunity to really drive change in because you are moving their cheese, right, to use that acronym. And that can be a good thing. But to your direct question, I, for a large organization, this is probably going to be a months long transition because you've got to do it right. Um, you'll start with the IT department. You'll get them bought in and, and understanding, not necessarily from a sales perspective. You want to it's a tool for the business, so they should be making a decision on their, their tools, in my opinion. But but when you actually get to brass tacks and implementation, you start with the IT department and get them settled in so they know how to control and manage and use the tool. Because they're the guys that are going to be handling the support tickets at some point, and at least at the beginning, and, and fixing things. The next is what we call, we have guides. Um, we call them Google guides, it could be Microsoft guides, I'm sure. But guides that take you on the journey. A lot of times they're millennials, right? It's a great way for them to actually interact with people are way above them in the, uh, the org chart, but it's a way that people can kind of 
that are interested in Google or have some experience or know something can kind of jump ahead and bring everybody with them. And so they're onboarded, set up, and they're using it before everybody else. It gives you a nice soft landing when you then flip the switch, which is typically a pretty big non-event. It's like, where's this button? Okay, it's over there. Okay, <laughs> and then they go on, right? Um, we actually see a fairly dramatic drop in uh, tickets submitted on that day, on the cutover day. But that can be, you know, that can be anywhere from, I'd say, a few months to a year, depending on the organization. And then that becomes an organizational question, right? Are we, are we diving into this? I've seen companies do it in less than a month that are pretty big gear shifts. Uh, underneath all that is the opportunity to just kind of stick your toe in, right? Do I need to move mail and calendar and everything? Are we going to make a whole change, change, wholesale change and really disrupt ourselves? Or are we going to just add in some cloud storage with some editors that allow us to collaborate just a little more efficiently and kind of add things on and introduce things in, in stages? So um, it can be quick. It's probably going to be a little bit more painful. It can be slow. That's probably unnecessary. I'd say three to six months is probably a good target for an enterprise organization to make the change over, um, but it depends on your change management strategy. I'm going to ask a couple questions. Culturally, it should, it's already changed, and it's all because we've been talking about the millennial. Shadow IT is real. I don't know how many yeah. times I've walked into a meeting and someone is presenting using some solution that's not a standard to the company, but their whole team is already using it. Yeah. It's like, embrace it. And we're scrambling to embrace that technology and put it into play. Culturally. So, we have to be much faster than the traditional, okay, let's analyze, research, investigate, and then deploy. We're already out of the, uh, out of the game if we go that approach. Yeah, and I would say you're right. The culture has changed just whether your organization realizes it and is changing with it or is like trying to hold it off. Because I, I don't know, one of my slides had it there. It's 50% of the workforce is millennials. You're right. They, they know how to get something on their phone or just to not have their phone on the network. And we'll completely collaborate out of network here. And, and you know, where does that leave you? You have proprietary content that's potentially being exposed. You have ideas that are lost if that person leaves or loses their phone, and all sorts of you know, terrible things that come with shadow IT. And so getting your arms around it, giving them the easiest path is to give them the tools they are, they're asking for in a way that they sort of made the selection and were part of that process in, in, as best you can. Getting the CEO to kind of outline how this is a path forward for us. It's going to make work happier, but also make us way more competitive with these companies that are biting at our heels. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, this is David RBC from Morgan. Um, you guys have talked a little bit about workplace, not just conferencing, but workplace. Yeah, yeah. The floors, the way you've designed the floors, the huddle spaces, all of that. Yeah. What kind of journey did you guys go on to kind of optimize that that layout? You know, we're building new headquarters. You know, yeah. we're thinking about this stuff. and. You know, it's, it's you know, good to hear from someone who's already done it. Yeah, so I'm probably not the right person to tell that story. I'll tell what I can. Um, we have a, a real estate workspace group, Roos, that quite frankly would be great to meet with. They, they're phenomenal, by the way. Like when they come in and, and speak with customers and, and partners, it's it's always educational for me. Um, I think it started backwards, right? Like we're like, hey, we're in this cool garage where we can play ball hockey out front. How do we move that into our corporate headquarters? Uh, and then, oh wait, this actually has some benefits because when people go out and play ball hockey, they can make a decision on something that they were stuck on. Uh, and so that's how the kind of whimsy and the spaces started out. And then it was like, hey, this is a lot like a university campus and let's kind of keep it going. On the other side of it though was, we're a data company. Is this actually having an impact? Is feeding you know, 60,000 people on a daily basis actually helping our bottom line or is it hurting it? So we collect data, I swipe in when I, when I get food. I don't have to actually voluntarily swipe in, so they must account for, you know, a certain percentage is going to be like, they're watching me, so I'm not going to swipe in, and, and a certain percentage is going to swipe in. But they, they kind of take that data and then apply that to the space that they're trying to create. So, um, for example, our micro kitchens are, I think, 200 feet walk, because after that, it starts to become less productive. You get you know, get distracted by a piece of tinfoil or something on the way, and you never find your desk. Uh, the idea being, that's what we need to let somebody go grab a snack, maybe run into somebody, have an interesting water cooler conversation to get back to their desk without impacting productivity. So they have a whole set of kind of data tools they use to analyze that and, and build their space. Um, I think you know the, one of the biggest sort of benefits I've seen of our spaces is these two-person phone booths. I, I keep harping on that a little bit maybe, I don't know, but like somebody mentioned a conference room where one person's on a video conference, like a huge table. 
it still happens here occasionally, but there's so many two-person booths that there's no real justification for that anymore. We started dropping in uh, mobile two-person booths that are just like soundproof. Oh, Framery yeah, makes these little all-in-one booths, so that list gives some little agility. And that's what we've tried to pivot to is um, a, a modular style of meeting space that we can, can reconfigure. So what's in those two person booths? Okay, uh, just a table and soundproofing and power. Okay. Uh, yeah. no, no. no video conference today. I, I looked at them like, we need to put some video conference these. I could see that down the road. I think right now we're just kind of feeling out the way that that impacts our space. It's more of a temporary thing when, like right now, we're going through a burst in New York and there's a lack of space for everything from a desk to a meeting room, so those solve for that. Um, but yeah, they're just kind of bare bones, soundproof power. I think airflow too, actually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. As a lesson learned from us, if we just renovated to open work space, we have a lot of huddle rooms, we need a lot more whisper rooms. These yeah. two person if we could do it over, we'd probably take half our huddle rooms away and put four whisper rooms. Yeah, I think that's that's probably where we're at. Like, you either, if you went through this hall, you could just go by a row of, of these two-person rooms, like a massive row. On the other side, there's like maybe 10 big meeting rooms, but by 20 small spaces. And, and the impact that has is dramatic. And sometimes you need a personal call. Sometimes, for me, it's like customer presentations. I don't want people talking. I will say, I don't know when, but we, you know, we're trying to figure out ways that AI can help with some of that sound. Uh, you know, keep listening, but we're, we're we're trying to leverage a few things that, that take that open workspace and make that a little bit more functional from a, a noise standpoint. Is there any notion of time-shared uh, cubicles for, for tall walls when you don't have to collaborate? It'd be kind of neat for you to break up a, hey, my tall wall time is between 8 and 10, is between 10 and noon, or is between noon and 2, so you can get some, like, port in a storm. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't, we don't really, I don't say we have that. There's spaces you can just go and kind of turn into that to a certain degree. Um, there's like no shortage of spaces that you can go and find. And some of them are, are quiet, some of them are definitely not. Like I, I work out of a cafe sometimes that has music blaring and it's great when I'm not on the call, but if I'm on a call, I need to find a quiet space. I'd say we, we have them, but they're not officially that, if that makes sense. So we do that more by just having spaces like that. Um, I can't think of any kind of bookable, tall walls sort of scenarios. And lately we've been going with big open areas and, uh, and that's And you don't have to worry about folks squatting or anything like that. Oh, Bob's always in. Uh, not too much. I mean, so, you know, when, when people are visiting and somebody's out of town, they'll squat their desk, but it's not usually a problem. And, and if, if there isn't a desk, there's always a table you can sit at that's not too far away. Like, that's another benefit of the, the cafes and the micro kitchens is they always have tables to work at and, um, there's, there's a seat over here that I love to get a, a view of Manhattan, and, and it's pretty quiet. I can be on a meeting, or I can just do quiet work. So I'd say it's kind of built in, but not bookable. And we struggled with not bookable, actually. Um, we've made all of our two-person rooms bookable because of squatting. That was what was happening. People were like, oh, I'm just going to have my own office here. It's got everything I need, you know. Uh, so that kind of ended, which I think is a good thing. Uh, it's still hard to book a meeting space here, I, I'll be honest, you know, full disclosure, there's a lot of people in this space and there's always more and, and we still struggle with that. We built some things in the tool to debook rooms when they're not in use. Um, so that's helped dramatically. Called, the original was called Meeting Nanny. It would uh, scold you with an email and then start debooking all your stuff after that. Uh, you got too many points, it would get really nasty with you and it's, <laughs> we have a bunch of weird automated stuff here. There's one that's like, um, if you congratulate, if you get on a mail thread with too many people congratulating, it'll come in and be like, hey, congratulations to everybody, let's stop this now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I need this to stop. Anyway. I also want to mention, if anyone wants a tour of the facilities after this, I'm happy to give that to yeah, anybody. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. And, and, and it is kind of interesting, uh, like I said, there's there's spaces where you'll see, uh, my first week here, I used to, or first few months, actually, I'd walk by the same spot and see the same guy asleep on the same beanbag chair every day. And I'm like, it's a really weird place, but but <laughs> presumably it was productive. He hung around. He's still here, to my knowledge. So, but, but there's that sort of thing. Um, there's uh, I, there used to be a, a bridge that went nowhere, and that was a fantastic quiet space that you could work on. So, so it's a definitely a cool space to check out. My name is Danny from Onimax. So you presented and made a good case for G Suite being a set of business tools to enable. Collaboration, uh, uh, 
as a company ourselves in the digital signage space who have to work with you know hardware manufacturers and a bunch of different software manufacturers to make client tools work. Um, we able to see executives who have invested heavily in making a broad set of tools work for them, right? So they've invested, say, a team system and a telecom system, and then they have WebEx and backup, and then they have their CRM. So they've invested in all these things. What is the case you're making to them when you go move completely over to the G Suite and you'll still be able to continue to work the way you want to work and you won't be on an island? Yeah. So, I mean, on one hand, we're not necessarily going to say you have to move over full scale. Like we, we do provide some intermediate steps. You can take, hey, just use Drive or um, you know, use just use Mail. Maybe you're, you're going to use your own uh, like box or something like that. But so there is ways of using part of it. Just to be clear, uh, but I think you know, there's a few things. One, when you move over with us, I think one of the things you got to think is, is the stuff I'm shedding that important, and is the stuff I'm getting going to supersede that by far? And that's our first fundamental belief is. The collaboration, the connectivity that you create, both between you and the co your coworkers, and between you and your applications within that stack, is going to supersede any you know, of the hundred fonts you lost or the uh, the macro that you, you need to create. So um, that's I think the, the first message I would say is that the benefits outweigh the costs in that. Uh, I think when it comes to incorporating things like a CRM or an ERP, we made a lot of headway in, in getting Salesforce in there, getting um, uh, SAP in, in to be a uh, first class citizen. So we're trying to extend that that uh, integration. Slack works great with Google. Zoom works great with Google, right? Like we, we've tried to incorporate products that we see are doing the same forward looking as we are. Uh, we're not necessarily back integrating well, and, and uh, you know I think that's a Google thing. We're we're doing it. We do it through a few methodologies, but where our bread and butter, what we're good at, is integrating forward, sort of you know, or thinking forward and, and being digital native. So. We do have a lot of those integrations and can, can work there. Um, I think like if you've invested in something that isn't part of our stack, we'll look for a way to, for that to work. If you're invested in something that's part of our stack, well, maybe you can retire that the cost of that application and that goes back into your, your budget, right? And like I said, the benefit you get out of it should give you more money to spend on reintegrating something that is there any specifics that, that you would say? Like, is it is it a particular product that you've seen struggle with the G Suite environment? No. So, as a company who works heavily in leveraging APIs to get yeah. information out of the screens, we actually like things like Google Sheets because <laughs> yeah. it gives us uh, good APIs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think it's fantastic for us. But uh, I do have to make the case to a lot of executives every day who are saying, you know, what APIs do you guys integrate with for a lot of different products out there? Because I've invested heavily. Yeah. So we're saying moving to our product will allow you to continue to collaborate uh, with all these different products. So for you guys, I'm wondering, that's the complete opposite direction is what's there on your product. Sure, they'll have the APIs, but on some level, they're still on an island in the sense that we won't always work with everybody else. I want to have a conversation with someone who's fully in the Google Suite. I have to go get that from the plugin at the yeah. end of the day, right, to make yeah. it work. So I guess you're just saying, make sure it's worth it for you at the end of the day. That and just look at the pain that comes with it. And yeah, well, I, I guess to a certain extent, I think like I think there's some benefit that comes with that pain. So it may be that you find the pain that I'm having isn't that big of a deal in this this new environment. Um, I also, you know, a lot of times we have a tool that, that can replace that, and where it's not like say a CRM, we have a pretty good integration story. We're getting there. And, you know, um, I think you know, so we brought up our we only do uh, interoperability through one tool today for meeting rooms, for example. Um, that was selected because they brought us the most ways to interrupt in one shot. Um, we wanted it to be a meet experience because we believe in that simplicity um, design theory. Like We felt we had the simplest solution. I'd say Zoom's pretty good on that, too. Um, we're both WebRTC-based uh, solutions that are probably just at our frenemy point now, so we'll see where that goes, but uh, it's, you know, it, that's a challenging one since we're very similar and um, both want to have our way, I think. We want to thank Sandy Jones. Uh, we have to be out of here.